and speed. Uh, we relied on established systems to detect and to reduce uh, any fraud in the system and that we worked well with partners uh, across the country. Uh, yes, it suggests some lessons that we should learn and with all aspects of the pandemic, we will make sure we learn those lessons. Anna Sarwar. For the first time, the First Minister is denying the reality in the report. Uh, what it refers to is money that was committed but not spent. Uh, and it makes clear about reserves that yes, it's a good thing to build reserves, but using emergency money to do it is not. It's the equivalent of taking a payday loan and putting it in your current savings account. It doesn't work and it isn't good for Scotland. But this isn't the first time that Audit Scotland have highlighted this government's incompetence. As is typical with this SNP government, there is a culture of contempt for anyone who dares ask a difficult question or exposes an inconvenient truth. Even when it's one of your own, they close ranks and give them a slap on the wrist instead. And now in the face of uncomfortable truths about their financial mismanagement, SNP figures are openly talking of, I quote, clipping the wings of Audit Scotland. They've already cut their budget by nearly a fifth since they came to power, and the spending review makes clear there are year on years of cuts to come. Isn't it the case that Nicola Sturgeon is cutting Audit Scotland's budget because it makes it harder for them to do their job, it makes it harder for them to expose this government's failures, and it makes it easier for her to get away with it? First Minister. Oh dear, I thought Anna Sarwar might have done some basic homework before uh, coming to this chamber. I've got some news uh, for Anna Sarwar on that point. Uh, the Scottish Government doesn't actually set the budget for Audit Scotland. The budget for Audit Scotland is independently funded through the Scottish Parliament uh, and the audit fees that public bodies pay for it. Members, so members, I would have thought you might. Members, known Mr that. Swinney, the figures. Members, I'm sorry, I cannot hear a word the First Minister is saying, and I'm sure that we would all like to hear this session. First Minister. Uh, I'm not sure Anna Sarwar will want to hear this, but I certainly want him to. Uh, the figures in the spending review uh, in relation to Audit Scotland are illustrative because we have to have illustrative figures, but they don't replace the independent processes whereby this Parliament scrutinises and determines the budget of Audit Scotland. That's just basic stuff that I would have thought a leader of an opposition party might have known. <laughs> Secondly, on reserves, uh, the reserves were fully utilised as part of the 21-22 budget, budget management process. They were transparently allocated within the budget revisions. That includes the £134 million of COVID funding, specifically ring fence for health. No funding currently in the Scottish Reserve relates at all to COVID-19 business support funding. Again, basic stuff that I might have thought a leader of an opposition party would have known. Um, and lastly, presiding officer, uh, Anna Sarwar accuses me of being uh, selective in my uh, quoting of the Audit Scotland report. So I'm actually, I've got it here. It's page four. It's the actual report. I'm just going to read from it. The Scottish Government worked collaboratively and at pace with local and UK government to direct significant public spending in difficult circumstances. It's critical that lessons are learned about what uh, worked well and what needs to improve. Uh, secondly, the Scottish Government streamlined governance arrangements to direct funds quickly uh, and it goes on to say yes it's hard to see how some financial decisions were reached but that's because we were uh, acting quickly because it was a global pandemic yeah, yeah. thirdly the scottish government directed a large proportion of funding to councils and Briefly, to First other public bodies who had existing systems and local knowledge to enable them to spend quickly uh, and fourthly the scottish government has managed its overall budget effectively yes some covid-19 funding remains unspent but that's because this report didn't go up to the end of the financial year Again, Again, presiding officer, really basic stuff that I would have thought the leader of the opposition would have known. Anna Sarwar. Nicola Sturgeon can be as condescending as she likes. We're used to it. Right? But, the, but the reality is, the reality is she's selectively quoting on one page when the report makes clear that it's not clear where the COVID recovery money is going to be spent. And there are billions of pounds of reserves sitting in IGB accounts or in local government accounts. That is money that should be spent on the recovery. And on the spending review, it makes clear year after year after year that it's a standstill budget for the Scottish Parliament and for Audit Scotland. And that means in real terms, a year after year budget cut for Audit Scotland, meaning clipping their wings. 
Now, no wonder Nicola Sturgeon wants to hide and distract from her failures, mm -hmm. not focusing on the rising child and pensioner poverty on her watch, not focusing on the drugs deaths that have more than doubled on her watch, not focusing on the attainment gap that is still wide open on her watch, not focusing on the 700,000 people waiting on an NHS waiting list on her watch. Instead, what do we get? Not the Nicola Sturgeon we saw during the pandemic, but a return to the Nicola Sturgeon who wants to divide our country and pit Scott against Scott. After 15 years of this SNP government and eight years as First Minister, when will she stop pretending she's in opposition and start governing for the people of Scotland? First Minister. Forgive me, Presiding Officer, but when Anna Sarwar comes to this chamber and just makes basic errors. It's not condescending to point that out. It's not my job uh, to hide the incompetence of the leader of the Scottish Labour Party. It's my job to put facts in front of the Scottish people. Secondly, uh, Anas Sarwar talks about this government's use of our own powers. He mentioned child poverty. Can I remind him that Scotland is the only part of the UK uh, that has a child payment specifically to lift children out of poverty. And if Anas Sarwar uh, wasn't prepared to continue to support the situation where welfare powers lie in the hands of Tory Prime Ministers and Chancellors, instead get them into the hands of this Parliament, then we could do more and he might, just might, have a scrap more credibility. And on the issue of Scotland's right to choose, Anas Sarwar is perfectly entitled, although it's beyond me why he would want to, but he's perfectly entitled to team up with the Tories again to oppose independence. That is democracy. What he's not entitled to do is stand in the way of the Scottish people having the democratic right to choose. His position has him at odds with the trade union movement, with the STUC. It has him at odds with the constituency he would like to represent, where 60% of voters backed parties supporting a referendum. It has him at odds with his own party membership. A third of Scottish Labour voters support a second referendum on independence. It has him at odds with his own MPs, MSPs like Alec Rowley and Monica Lenny. Even Jackie Bailey said Labour were wrong to have done a deal with Better Together in the last campaign. But most fundamentally of all, presiding officer, Anas Sarwar's absurd position puts him at odds with any basic notion of democracy, and that's why he'll continue to struggle so badly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll now move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Natalie Don. Thank you.